Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, it's exciting to have uh, such a broad range of people joining us from all over the world, from whatever time zone you're in. It might be very early, maybe late, so we're very grateful. Um, this is the second webinar in a special series uh, that HITAP, the Health Intervention and Technology Assessment Program in Thailand, are co-hosting together with CHE, uh, the Center for Health Economics at the University of York. I am Jessica O'Hollick from CHE, um, and I will be your chair today. So I'm delighted to welcome you. Uh, and before I introduce our experts, I would like to go through a bit of housekeeping. So first of all, this webinar will be recorded to prepare summaries. Um, please all mute your microphones unless you're speaking. Uh, you may use the chat function to send questions uh, or comments or remarks at any time. And please use the raise hand function to show your interest in speaking. We're going to save all questions until the end of each presentation. Uh, now that that's out of the way, let me introduce our speakers and the agenda for the day. Uh, we have with us Dr. Laura Adney, uh, who is a research fellow at the College of Medicine and Public Health and the Flinders Institute for Mental Health and Wellbeing in Australia. Uh, Dr. Ejeoma Edoka, who is a principal researcher at Health Economics and Epi Epidemiology Research Office at the University of Witzwaters-Rand, South Africa. We have Professor Paul rodriguez Lesmes, uh, who is stepping in for Dr. S Oxer Oscar Espinosa today. So thank you, um, Professor rodriguez Lesmes, for doing this um, last minute. Um, he is an assistant professor in the School of Economics at the University del Rosario in Colombia. And finally, James Lomas, who is a lecturer at the Department of Economics and Related Studies uh, at the University of York in the UK. So I'm very excited to have this excellent group of experts here with us, and I hope that you find the session enriching. Each of our experts will speak for 10 minutes, and we will have 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, uh, during which James will join me as co-chair. All right, uh, Laura, please kick us off. Thank you, Jessica. Um, can you see those slides okay? Uh, yes, they're just uh, perfect. Thank you, Laura. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so again, yeah, thank you, Jessica and team. Um, well, firstly, for putting together this webinar series, which um, has been really fantastic so far, um, and also for inviting um, me to be a part of it today. Um, so I'm excited to be um, here talking about health opportunity costs because um, it is an area that I have really enjoyed um, working in and hope and hope to continue working in in the future. Um, I will just say it is quite late at night here, um, but hopefully uh, we won't be disturbed. Um, so my aim for today is to um, discuss our 2022 publication with you. Um, and the, the aim of this um, publication uh, was to review um, key methodological approaches that have been taken by countries to estimate the marginal cost um, per unit of health produced by that healthcare system. Um, and the rationale for this paper was um, really that um, we had just finished um, estimating an empirical threshold for Australia um, and we'd spent a good deal of time going through the different methodological approaches taken um, by the two publications that were available at that time um, and they were for the UK and Spain. Um, and given that there are now quite a few more estimates, we really thought um, that this could be a publication that would be useful uh, for a broader audience. Um, and so I will highlight that um, Jessica, our chair today, um, James, our discussant, um, and Ijeoma, um, one of our um, next speakers who'll be outlining the strategy taken in South Africa, um, they're actually all co-authors on this publication as well, so I have to um, thank them all for their input as well. Um, so I only have 10 minutes to summarise this paper, so um, I wanted to really focus on um, what were some of the key take-homes for me from this paper. Um, and this is really centred around some of those steps immediately prior to the empirical estimation, which um, I hope will lead well into the next two presentations that are looking um, at 
actual specific approaches taken for, for two different countries. Um, so I'll start with a background to just one slide on um, health opportunity costs and cost effectiveness threshold. Um, and then I want to talk about the context um, and the available data and how these influence um, our empirical estimates of health opportunity costs. Um, and then I've just got uh, one or two slides on some extensions that um, I wanted to include for discussion. Um, so in the in this publication, we were quite explicit that we were looking at um, papers that had estimated the marginal impact of health spending on health outcomes. Um, and that that could be um, used as the basis to estimate health opportunity costs. Um, now, we didn't use the um, word threshold as much as um, we could help it um, because, um, and this is as Laura described um, last November, because a threshold can really represent many things um, to different people, um, only one of which is health opportunity costs. Um, but we are um, taking the perspective here that um, from a healthcare system perspective, operating within a fixed healthcare budget, then we do believe that um, health opportunity costs are um, the relevant piece of information that should be used to define um, cost effectiveness thresholds. So the, um, the publications that we reviewed uh, within our publication, um, the first to provide an empirical strategy uh, was that from the UK. Um, and this had um, built upon prior work that had been conducted in the UK um, before 2015 as well. And this is um, obviously a really important um, piece of work and it provided us with uh, one methodological approach that was specific to one healthcare system. So that was the national healthcare system and its funding mechanisms um, and the data that were available at the time um, to estimate their, um, their um, empirical estimate of health opportunity costs. And the basic um, DAG that they're trying to estimate, that we're trying to estimate, is the causal impact of spending the X there on health outcomes and um, controlling for healthcare need. And this is estimated in different ways across all the different nas national estimates that we currently have available. And that's um, based on the, the different contexts and also what is considered the ideal measurement of these key variables based on those differences in the context. And so therefore, I think we, we do really need to carefully consider this um, decision-making context in the first stage. And so some specific questions around uh, funding mechanisms. So um, questions around um, how is health funded? Um, so is it a public um, healthcare system or is it a mix of public and private healthcare? Um, and so, for example, if it's a mix of public and private healthcare operating within um, a healthcare system with a national HTA body for public spending, then to assess the impact of um, public healthcare spending on health outcomes, we also need to control for um, private health insurance and out-of-pocket costs in addition to um, healthcare need. And we also need to think about how funding is distributed. Um, so is it distributed based on need? Um, is it distributed based on healthcare areas like hospitals or primary care, or is it distributed based on geographical area? Um, and the answers to these questions will inform the types of um, methodological approach that you take. And then we also need to think about um, the decision makers who will be using this estimate. Um, and this is because we really want to understand the um, scope of uh, the decision making. Um, so is there a national body um, can, or can decisions differ by region? Um, and this really helps to define the scope of the um, type of data that you will need and, and the level of aggregation that will be required. Um, and then more basically as well, when we know the decision-making context, we can look at the committee guidelines and we can ensure that we follow those um, as closely as possible where feasible um, within our empirical estimates. And we also, um, need to use this information on the decision makers to identify who might be invited to join an advisory group to support our empirical estimation. Um, so I'm including this here as a sort of um, a separate bubble because I, I think it's quite important. Um, it's important because there are lots of um, decisions that you're making in the um, empirical strategy that policymakers can use, usefully inform. Um, but also the eventual use of your estimate of health opportunity costs really depends on the understanding of health opportunity costs and also the acceptance of this estimate by the member, the, the type of people that are members of your advisory board, so, so them and their colleagues. Um, so having their involvement um, from very early stages, um, I think, uh, can help increase the, the use of your estimate to inform cost effectiveness thresholds. 
And so once we've sort of um, got an understanding of this context, then we can start thinking about how this informs ideal measurement. Um, and so just thinking about how to best approximate this DAG from the earlier slide based on your context and thinking about what data we, we need. Um, and then we can start mapping um, that available data. And we need to think about the, the data that we need to define the variables and at what level is the data available and for how many years is available. Um, and this is where we're going to start making um, trade-offs or where trade-offs are really inevitable. Um, so, so one example that um, we've often faced is um, do we take the preferred panel approach um, but using data at a much higher level of aggregation or um, you know, this is compared to taking an instrumental variable approach with, with only cross-sectional data but with data available at a much lower geographical area. So, um, so they're the types of trade-offs that you, you might be needing to think about and that an advisory group can be really useful to inform on as well. So the last step there is the data acquisition, but before acquiring that data, um, you definitely need to utilise that advisory board to support these decisions. Um, and I think that the advisory board can also be really helpful to be explicit about the, the different options that um, are available to you and the assumptions and the outcomes associated with those different options. Um, and like I said, their involvement can only help support the, the understanding and, and potentially the, um, the eventual use of, of your final empirical estimate. Um, and I, I hope I'm not running too short of time, but I just wanted to, to highlight a couple of extensions from, from where I see it. Um, and the first is that um, although we've been talking here about the estimated health opportunity costs um, to inform cost-effective thresholds, I think they, they can also be really usefully used as a measure of health system performance. Um, and I think this is important to highlight because um, I think it might be an easier way to um, commence uh, their use in, in policy and potentially increase the acceptance of the use of these types of um, empirical estimates. And it also might increase the funding to enable us to refine um, our methods in this area. Um, so an example here is um, the performance reporting dashboard for Australia. Um, so for all healthcare here, the only um, sort of values that we have in here are life expectancy. And so it would be really useful to include something like change in an empirical estimate of health opportunity costs over time. Um, it raises a lot of questions though as well. And um, so some of these were highlighted, I think, by Nancy in November last year um, around the implications of a changing empirical estimate of health opportunity costs and also what the implications of that are for decision makers, how do they actually use that information. And some other um, future directions are around um, extensions from um, Laura, who presented in um, November last year, and, and also from some work from James and co his colleagues, who, who we'll hear from later on in today. Um, but particularly, um, I'm interested in thinking about the impact of health spending beyond health, so the impact on um, areas like wellbeing and productivity. And I'm also really interested in the impact of um, non-health spending on health. And then another area, um, and this is thinking, uh, potentially thinking about the relevance of all this information that we now have about the health budget and whether uh, whether this is of relevance um, outside the health budget, whether similar methods could be applied to non-health budgets, such as the education or the self social welfare budget, to either understand the efficiency within those budgets or to support more formal evaluation of services funded um, within the budgets. Um, so there, there are some potential areas that we, we're currently thinking about at the moment. Um, and I'm conscious of time, um, so I will wrap up and say um, thank you very much uh, for your time today and thank you for the organisers and the other presenters as well. I'll hand back over to Jessica. Thank you, um, Laura, for that fantastic presentation. Um, and I will pass off to Ijeoma, please. Thanks, Jessica. I'll just um, share my presentation now for the right one. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, just leading off from Laura, Laura's presentation, I'll be uh, speaking to the um, work we conducted in South Africa, estimating the cost effectiveness thresholds for, for South Africa. And this work was done in, in um, well, published in 2020. 
Um, so I'll just give a, a brief uh, background and uh, motivating for why we did one for South Africa. Uh, talk a little bit of our, on our estimation strategy and the challenges we faced. I think Laura highlight, highlighted them, but maybe I'll focus on how we dealt with those challenges. I'll um, just briefly um, present some of our findings and, and make a few concluding remarks. So um, currently in South Africa, there are no um, formal national Haiti institution, but it's expected that um, Haiti and cost effectiveness analysis will play a significant role um, on the proposed NHI for making uh, resource allocation decisions around health technologies to be included within the health benefit package. Um, but having said that, currently several public and private health sector institutions adopt uh, some form of HTA. So for example, the national and provincial departments of health in South Africa um, do use health technology some form of health technology assessment and cost effectiveness analysis for making decisions around what should be included within the national essential medicines list as well as um, uh, and the provinces also for, for their own um, um, essential medicines list, which are often adopted from the national essential medicines list. Um, national Treasury also does apply some kind of uh, health technology assessment to, to make decisions around whether to fund um, um, the health budgets proposed by the National Department of Health. And other private uh, institutions also do apply health technology assessment. But uh, the aim of our study was to kind of support those methodological considerations for resource allocation decisions, but focusing mainly on the public health sector, but currently and potentially for use during uh, when when the, the national health insurance um, um, scheme has been put in place in South Africa. So in terms of our approach, we we kind of I we all split it here into three three steps, but you know just just for ease of ex explanation. But and um, the first step is basically estimating those. Elasticity, elasticities, which Laura spoke through um, just now. Um, and then we uh, estimated um, a marginal product of health spending as, as well as marginal cost per daily averted. So in, in the first step, the, the idea here was to try to um, address the methodolo methodological challenges of identifying exogenous uh, impact of health spending on, on health outcomes. And so we try to address both unobserved heterogeneity, which could potentially result in omitted viral bias and, and reverse and reverse causality. And, and to do this, we adopted a fixed effect estimation approach where we use provincial level variation in health spending and mortality. And I think it might be worth mentioning here and just linking back to uh, Laura's presentation that, um, you know, provincial level health spending um, or, or, or um, funding of health systems is, is basically the, uh, under, falls under the jurisdictions of, of the provinces. So they have complete autonomy how they use, uh, the, how they utilize the health budget. But, but the National Department of Health does have a formula for making resource uh, allocating um, uh, total funds to provinces, and one of one of it is based uh, the the health component uh, accounts a very high proportion of that, and is based on um, uh, what they call a provisional pro provincial equitable share formula that is determined by the income level of the province. And some kind of uh, healthcare needs, like H, um, you know, number of beds and and the, the the size of the population. So there's some thought that goes into how provinces get the funds, but but once they do get the funds, they have complete autonomy over how they they distribute the funds, both within and outside the the health sector. But anyway, our unit of analysis here was the provincial level, and we use. Uh, variations in health spending and mortality accounting for 
um, there were 14, it was the 14 year panel data. So we're able to capture um, time and province fixed effects um, and, uh, and, uh, and also included large uh, variables that health expenditure variables to control for the impact of um, uh, earlier years spending on, uh, on health on contemporaneous health uh, elasticities. And uh, I think we used, we used three lives of health spending here. And our outcome here of interest is basically the elasticity, which is the percentage in percent change in mortality with a 1% in change in health spending. Um, perhaps not very uh, important, but I just thought to mention the variables that we controlled for. Um, we uh, included medical aid coverage, which is also uh, a determinant of the, in the provincial equitable share formula and also tries in you know, some way a proxy for private health spending, which we control for. Um, so private health spending in, in, in South Africa constitutes about 50% of the total health spending in South Africa, although you know, the, the private sector only serves a, small, a smaller proportion of the population, less than 20%. So it, it, I think it was important to, to control for that here, given that we used um, uh, total, uh, you know, the crude debt, the health, our health outcome wasn't specific to the public health sector. Um, and then GDP per capita and also a, a bunch of uh, um, healthcare need variables to try to minimize the, the impact of, of um, to try to minimize the um, impact of variables that would simultaneously impact on health spending and health outcomes. And obviously the fixed effect approach accounted uh, for some, but not all unobserved um, heterogeneity. Okay, so then in, in the second step, we, we um, use the elasticities from there to estimate first deaths averted and yet, years of life lost averted and YLD and the combination of that gave us the debts averted per 1% increase in spending um, and, and then the marginal cost per daily averted or the cost effectiveness threshold was simply the inverse of step one. Um, data sources were mostly South Africa, well mostly South Africa specific except for um, the last, the y, uh, population level YLD, which came from IHME, uh, Global Burden of Disease Database, and, and, and well, South Africa specific, but not locally sourced. And, and uh, WHO Life Tables was a source for um, conditional life expectancy for South Africa. And the other variables, all the control variables either came from district or household data, uh, household um, level surveys and, and also the, uh, public health spending uh, came directly from the national treasury budget reviews that are published every year on all the spending within the public health, within the public sector of South Africa. So, uh, in terms of our estimates, we estimated as of 2015 a threshold of 38,500, approximately 38,500 rand, South African rands per padali averted, which is uh, at the time 58% of, uh, uh, of the South African GDP per capita. So I'll just conclude by making a few comments around how this threshold has been used in South Africa since then. Um, I did mention that there are no uh, national health technology assessment um, agencies in South Africa, although you know various the, the National Department of Health or, or divisions within the National Department of Health do formally apply health technology assessment for making decisions around, for example, the essential medicine police and um, developing standard treatment guidelines. Uh, but, the, you know, it's not necessarily the threshold that we've estimated here. Uh, not There's been no formal adoption for South Africa, but 
um, a recent uh, help HTA methods guide that was published, developed by the National Department of Health and published last year, um, recommends its use as an indicative cost effectiveness threshold to interpret results of cost utility analysis. And um, increasingly, um, it's also been cited in research publications, although without looking at the context in, in which it's cited, it's difficult to know whether it's been cited in a positive light. But anyway, so I'll, I'll stop here and and, uh, and look forward to engaging during the Q&A. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ajayama. That was um, a great walkthrough of the work that you did in South Africa. Um, I will hand it over now to Paul, if you could share your slides, please. Okay, so thank you very much. Sure. Good. So, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm Paul Rodriguez, associate professor at the School of Economics at the University of Rosario, and I want to share with you the results of this uh, of the estimation of the Colombian uh, cost effectiveness threshold. It was published in Health Policy and Plan in 2022. And it was mainly found by the Ministry of Finance of the country through the Health Technology Assessment uh, Agency of the country. So we had in the presentation something about the cost effectiveness principle, but it has already been discussed, so we can go fast over this. So and also on the literacy route. So I will go straight to the context and then discuss the, the practical structure. So okay, this we have already gone. The objective of this study was to estimate the cost effective stress for, for Colombia, which is a middle income country with near near universal health insurance scores. But we have a very specific way of uh, of working in the health system that makes it a little bit uh, difficult uh, to to estimate this type of uh, of elements that are required for health technology assessments. So yeah, we follow very much uh, most of the people who is around here on, on the literature of how it, it is uh, estimated. And then we are going to use a strategy of instrumental variables, or, or that's what we did at that point, to be able to, to estimate this elasticity of expenditure and health outcomes. So which is the context of the country? We have a country where there is a managed competition of the health system. So that means that we have multiple insurers under a, under a mandatory insurance coverage system. They have to provide a fixed health benefit plan that is decided by the government. And everyone can move between insurers. So the insurance premium at the end that every individual has to pay is fixed uh, and is related to their income, not uh, through, it's not decided and cannot be amended by health insurers. And then these insurers have to buy services in the open market. Most, most of services, of course, there are exceptions. So then the, the bit that makes it a little bit different is one is going to be one of the limitations of the system is that the system is kind of a split in two. So half is a, a standard and financed through the payroll taxes. But then we have half of the population of the country that don't have formal employed, like a formal employment. That means that they are not paying for social security every every month. The only way on through the they provide taxes to the government is through indirect taxes, basically VAT and similar. So for this reason, we have an alternative uh, system that is the subsidized system. It works exactly the same but the premium is paid directly by the government. Uh, a bit like, uh, as in the case of South Africa, we have a very small voluntary private insurance. Most of it, it is a complement to the actual health system that it's available. And the uh, insure, like providers are a mix of uh, public and private companies in general. There is no restriction to enter into this market. So the central bit that enables us to compute the, the threshold is that the, like these insurance companies has to report to the central government all the health claims that they have in order to prove that they have used the money that they receive for buying health services that, that are in the plan. 
part, it is also used to compute the capitation that is required or that there is sufficient to maintain the health uh, as it is working, like the health system as it works. It's a sufficiency study, not an actual actuarial uh, computation of the premium, but it, it is a study that's done every day, every year. So for this reason, we will have information about all health claims in the country for, uh, for several years that we can link with mortality data. What is a bit the limitation that the quality of the information in the subsidized uh, element like half of the system is not very good. And for this reason is normally, not, or in, in the present year it's just a little bit, but in the period that we're analyzing, this information was not available for research. So, so we are computing half of the, like the, the, the elasticity is based on half of the system. So which is the information that we're using? So first this claims data was uh, telling you minutes before. It is produced by health providers. Then it is audited by health insurers, sent to a government who also performs an auditing process. So that means that in general, we have very good data in terms of health expenditures and in terms of health outcomes. What you see here in, at the bottom basically is, is the distribution of the lock expenditure per capita per year, which like is, is relatively well behaved. We also have information about price regulation. Several of the technologies in the country are subject to, in the, to international price uh, regulation. And we will use information of vital statistics. So let me go through a, a little bit of how it works, the, the data we have for, for computing, like the health outcomes part, where we have mortality data level, which is of course at the individual level, which we can link uh, directly to what happens to for the particular dimensions. Uh, we'll go a little bit, bit like uh, after which are the dimensions. Then we have information about life tables of the country are produced by the statistics departments. And the bit that we don't have in the country is the weights for quality of life. So we're essentially taking the information that, that was used by Claxon and other and the steam for the UK. That's what we have available, unfortunately. So with the information of uh, life expectancy and the actual mortality, we produce a group of cells for uh, the analysis. So these cells are based on the insurance company. So we are using information for 12 insurance companies that are the ones that operate in the contributory part of the health system. We're using type of region, so the, the system operates uh, nationwide. So there are like uh, different insurance companies by, by the states of the country, if you want, but the capitation transfer is fixed at the national level. So that means that we cannot use strategies like the one that was just discussed or some others like Bajek or the UK where that we can use or, or that is possible to use regional variation for it. Here, the variation is if the area is urban or is a rural area, or if it's a far area in the middle of the jungle, this type of, of elements is what the change a little bit the transfer, but, uh, but not a particular region gets more on it and the other. The other dimension that we use is uh, health conditions. So we're basically using ICD-10 chapters that are uh, like uh, assigned to each like expenditure in, in, in the health claims uh, data by the government. And then we have uh, the year we are using data from 2013 to 2017. So with this, we're able to produce like information at the cell level, like the combination of these characteristics on both mortality that we eventually uh, like transform into quality of just life year by like by weighting all these uh, years of life loss from mortality with the weights and um, and then health expenditure in every year on each one of the cells. So what is the empirical strategy? Essentially we're using if you want a fixed uh, effects model that eventually we complement with an instrumental variable the strategy where essentially we're instrumented expenditure in, in this regression where we have health outcomes that I have just described, and that we control for some particular characteristics of the cells, so characteristics of the regions and similar. But we have 
fixed effects at the level of the region and the, not the region, but the cell. Like it's a more granular. Eventually, we have like 737 cells, something like this, because of, of course, not all combination exists, but in, in general, we can control very well with the with individual characteristics, but there are elements that may be changing. So with this, we compute an elasticity. We're using the inverse hyperbolic thing, essentially, because there are some cells for which there is no mortality. So for this reason, a minority of the cells were small. So we essentially solve this by using this uh, hyperbolic uh, inverse scene, which is very much the same as the logarithm, but it uh, it is defined the, the function at zero. That's uh, the only difference. So then with the estimate of elasticity, which is this beta two, then we transform this into a cost effectiveness presentation with the standard form. So then we go into the issue of the instrument. So that regression that we have there, there is, is, potent, is, is feasible to estimate directly to the data, but the central issue as I discussed before is the endogeneity of the health expenditure and mortality. Of course, if people is, is dying more, then there is more expenditure as we just saw with COVID all this time. So what we are using here are several instruments. The, the main ones that are, we are presenting results essentially the price regulation in the country. Essentially, we are assessing the technologies that are regulated in the country. There is a ceiling in terms of uh, what uh, the companies can charge uh, to the health system for the for a particular medication, for instance. And this is decided yearly. So the government issues uh, uh, a new decree saying we are going to regulate this particular drug because it's too expensive and similar. and use that type of variation at the group of health uh, level and year as an instrument. The other is that some technologies are included in a part of the health benefits uh, um, plan and that, uh, that is uh, of automatically usage. So essentially insurance companies can use this money directly without uh, a part like a, a more complex process that is for, the, for those that are not in this list. This list is uh, updated yearly, and that eventually means, from what we have obtained from our research, that the technologies are used widely in the country and they are used more often. So that is also reflected in the expenditure for these particular cells, like groups of health. Wow. Cells. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask you to wrap up, please? We're over time yes, now. That's, that's the Thank last. You. So, with this, we get the estimates essentially. The like this number, we get the number of elasticities point. Uh, sorry, we have the, the elasticities point 16, point 15, if we use GLL or Wally, like weighting or not. And the number in terms of GDP per capita is 74% or 86%, which is in line with some other studies that are there. And for the estimates of the country and by this general like estimates by application regarding some years before. Okay, there are other instruments, more or less they, they get more or less the same results, some of them don't work very good. And uh, that's what we're doing. So we compute this uh, cost effectiveness threshold. It is used at this moment by, let me show you some uh, of the new cost effectiveness analysis of performing the country by the companies that are being used uh, like uh, to sell the products in, in the country, but it is not mandatory at this point to use it. The government is saying that this year they are starting to use um, cost effectiveness evaluation as part of the introduction of new technologies in the health system. So we expect it to be actually part of the decision process in the country in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm going to hand it over to James now, if you could please share your slides, James. Yes, one second, let me just get these up. Okay, can you see those slides? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great. Um, hello everyone, thanks very much for the opportunity to be the discussant of this excellent session. Um, I'm just going to provide a sort of short summary 
of what's been talked about and in doing so uh, reflect upon a few things that I think we can discuss a bit further uh, once I've finished. Um, so I've then also got a summary of my summary in a way uh, to finish. Um, oh, let me see. Okay, did the slide just change? Can I just check? Yes, it did. Okay, great, right. So uh, my summary, well, I'll begin by more or less stating the obvious, um, good place to start. Um, and then what I hope to do is to kind of highlight some broad themes um, in this discussion. I think that there may be many people attending this who have uh, narrower technical questions that are, are great for the Q&A afterwards, but I'm gonna highlight some of the broader themes and points for discussion. And hopefully uh, reflect a little bit on what this uh, strand of research is and what it isn't. So stating the obvious to begin, you know, all of these papers are very much focused on estimating health opportunity costs as an empirical question and econometric strategies for trying to identify a sort of answer to this empirical question. And they all adopt a, a common underlying approach, which I consider to be effectively estimating the slope of a health production function, um, how healthcare expenditure uh, results in health outcomes uh, improving. So you know, this is important because while there is um, almost universal consensus that we need to think about opportunity costs when thinking about uh, the economics of uh, new technologies, um, there isn't so much consensus on the best way to estimate that opportunity cost. Um, I just wanted to flag that here because all of the studies here are very much on the supply side of things, estimating health opportunity costs, and not so much on the demand side, um, which is considered a separate question. And these are effectively alternatives to estimating opportunity costs, but they don't provide similar results in general. Um, and I'm going to now touch on a little bit why I think that the supply side is, is a very useful and relevant way of approaching this question. So to go back to this idea of the health production function, um, it's about how healthcare expenditure uh, it transforms into health outcomes. And what we can see on this very stylized, simple figure here is that the slope of this function will change at different levels of expenditure. And it's effectively the inverse of this slope that can provide the basis for a cost effectiveness threshold. But I also think it's really interesting to hear some reflections from Laura to begin with on other policy questions that this kind of evidence can inform. I think that might be something we can return to in discussion later. Another thing that you can see from this graph is that clearly the slope changes um, as the level of expenditure changes. And so we would expect different um, cost effectiveness thresholds to be relevant to different healthcare systems. So how does a health production function inform the cost effectiveness threshold? Well, here's a very um, simple uh, diagram um, reflecting cost effectiveness practice, a conventional practice. And we can see that if a new technology uh, delivered two qualities, um, and we're talking in the, the UK context, at different prices, this same technology would have a different incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And this dashed line here, the diagonal, is the cost effectiveness threshold, which we're saying is about £20,000 per quality adjusted life here in this case. So why does it help to have an estimate of a threshold that's based on the supply side and based on the health opportunity costs? Well, it means that we can go from looking at an ISA, which is here, either 10,000 or 20,000 pounds per quality, and start to think um, in addition about what that means in terms of net health benefit. And we can do that because our threshold here is reflecting health opportunity costs. So, what it allows us to do is to think about the lower price points here, where it comes in with an ISA of 10,000 pounds per quality. Um, what we see is that for each quality generated, there would be um, uh, sorry, for, for that level of expenditure, £20,000 for those two qualities, we would have a health opportunity cost of just one quality. And that means we would have a net health benefit 
uh, with an ISA of £10,000 per quali of one quali. Um, whereas if it was £20,000 per quali, um, we would have no net health benefit. And that's exactly why this kind of research is useful, to try and put in health terms what the costs mean and those costs on healthcare systems. We can also equally reflect um, net benefit in monetary terms, as demonstrated by the, the vertical difference here as well. Now, this kind of work um, has been an exciting area of research internationally in the last 10 years. Um, and this uh, figure here is unfortunately a little bit out of date now because we do have some new studies coming through. Of course, uh, the Colombian study is not on this figure because it just came out ever so slightly after it was produced by Mike Paulden. Um, and also, I believe Indonesia is another country that has published an estimate of this kind in recent years, and there may be others as well. Now, one thing that unites these studies is an acknowledgement of some technical difficulties that exist with the econometrics of trying to estimate this relationship. Um, and in, in a sense, these uh, challenges have been acknowledged in the literature within healthy economics for, for quite some time now. Um, and this excellent paper from, from the 80s actually provides a, a reasonably good overview of the challenges when trying to estimate this kind of relationship using country level data. I'm not gonna get into those, it's not time, but I think that there's probably a few there that if you're working on this kind of thing yourself, you've, you've encountered and you're kind of struggling with how to overcome it. And sometimes some innovative approaches have been adopted. And I think that was interesting to note from this set of presentations that there are of course different approaches to account for potential endogeneity in these studies. So in my work that I've done, I've tended to use an instrumental variable approach, um, but it's interesting to reflect on, on the sort of trade-offs that Laura identified to begin with in, in doing this. Um, and one issue with instrumental variables is, as you can see here by the chalice next to instrumental variable in the, the diagram at the bottom, is that sometimes the search for the perfect instrumental variable can be the search for the holy grail, i.e. it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to find an instrumental variable that will convince everyone um, is perfectly valid. Nevertheless, instrumental variables can be a useful tool, um, but I thought it's interesting to note that these two studies here um, used fixed effects in a panel data setting, and uh, only one of them in the base case used an instrumental variable approach. So I think it's quite exciting to think about alternatives to instruments, but also how they can be used to supplement other approaches as well that can help control for unobserved heterogeneity. I think that what was clear as well from the presentations was there's a, a real importance of context um, in two ways. Um, first of all, context determines what data is available. I think it's fair to say uh, we can be looking at administrative data, or, or we could be looking at uh, claims data from an insurance-based system. Uh, but not only in terms of data, but also in terms of the kind of policy questions that this kind of research can begin to answer. Um, and I think that that's a really important consideration and clearly has motivated studies to be um, adopted in, in slightly different ways across different jurisdictions. Another thing that I thought was interesting was the need to update these estimates over time as the um, marginal productivity or health opportunity costs within a health system evolve uh, with time. And just to open my points for discussion, I'll, I'll start where I just left off and say, when we're considering this to be an empirical question, I think it's quite interesting to me and an open question to think about how are we going to update this and also, can we possibly use our methods to sort of forecast what we think health opportunity costs will be in the future? Because that seems to me an important thing for how we conduct cost effectiveness analysis. And it doesn't seem straightforward how we might do that, given this approach. I think it'd be nice to discuss and get some thoughts on that from, from our speakers. Um, we can also touch upon the issue of whether there's a role for demand side approaches, perhaps 
in terms of whether they're more relevant in some contexts than others. Um, I think that would be a useful discussion, um, given that the focus here has been about the supply side. I think there's also a discussion to be had about the role demand side as well. Um, and then, of course, these differences between studies in terms of how endogeneity is accounted for and whether we need an instrumental variable and what the trade-offs are when we think about panel estimation. Um, Laura highlighted one in terms of the level of aggregation, but I think there might be others as well in terms of whether we're capturing a short run or a long run effect. And then leading on to a question of this ideal measurement concept, um, you know, what, what does that look like? Uh, almost all of the studies in this strand of literature have used aggregate level data and not individual level patient data. I mean, in, in a sense, would that be the ideal or, or would that also come with trade-offs? I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss as well. And then finally, um, yeah, it would be nice to talk about policy implications both within HTA, which has been the focus of these presentations, but perhaps also for thinking about roles for this kind of evidence in other policy contexts outside of HTA as well. I think we've already touched upon that a little bit in our discussion um, so far, but it might be something that people have questions on from the audience. And that's all I have to say. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, James. And um, a massive thank you to all of our presenters. That was uh, really fascinating uh, hearing from all of you about your experiences in estimating this in specific countries and looking at what, what has been done across different countries. Um, we've got about 15 or so minutes for the Q&A. Um, and so I would like to kick this off uh, with a question that we had from um, an audience member, uh, Marco Rubilar Gonzalez from Chile. Um, and he has uh, put a question in the chat box. So he asks, when should regional or provincial analysis be used? It's actually got a few questions. So maybe I'll put these all out there and then we can um, uh, sort of answer them depending on uh, as you wish, I suppose. The second question is, is it possible or compatible with a country threshold uh, with the estimation of more than one threshold, for example, considering different financing mechanisms or state funds? Um, then what are the main difficulties faced in estimating a threshold? Um, and if it were not to cover all the information due to registration problems, for example, which or how do we choose inf which information is representative of the population? So there are a few um, different questions in there. Uh, would anyone of our speakers like to kick us off in answering those? Hi, maybe you can say something about the difficulties uh, estimating a threshold that was addressed. I guess it, it, it includes several things. So first is the access to data. So. It's very difficult, as, as James was saying, ideally we wanted to use individual data, data with the directed outcomes, but it has been hard, even though the country has very good information system, to be actually able to merge it. Not because it's technically difficult, but uh, because it requires a lot of uh, red tape behind of getting access to the different elements of the health system, health statistics, and so on. So it took uh, years to be able to, to produce this at some point. That was probably the most difficult part. The next one is that is the instruments part. It was very difficult to actually come to some instrument that makes sense in terms of the statistical elements. And of course, there are always discussions about if it's a proper instrument and so on, as James was saying. So our strategy there was to try through all of them and be transparent and showing what happens when we have different ones. Of course, some of them go in completely opposite directions. With this, uh, it's important to report it, to show it uh, for discussions in, in, future, in future research of what could be a reason, if it makes sense to amend it, and, and, and so on. That, those are probably the main is issues uh, that, that we face. We wanted to do it by health conditions and so on, but we didn't get a like uh, enough uh, variation for the instruments to be able to do that. Thank 
Thanks, Paul. Yeah, you made some really good points there. Um, and in particular, uh, you mentioned the bureaucratic challenges of getting access to data and how that can take years. I think that that's probably something that others can relate to, um, something that is really important to consider um, when thinking about undertaking this kind of estimation, because this is a particularly uh, tricky one, I think, because there's often a policy demand and you know, you want to answer it as quickly as possible, but of course you want to also do it um, in the most rigorous way possible. And so then obviously the time required to get the data, to find the right instrumental variable. Um, can anyone else uh, say anything about the challenges with instrumental variables or um, maybe get back on some of the other uh, questions that were asked there in terms of um, looking at having more than one threshold, for example, considering mm -hmm. different financing mechanisms or state funds. That's something that uh, I've seen come up as a question from others as well. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I guess from my experience in Australia, um, we don't have ex an explicit threshold in our national um, HTA body, but there are implicit thresholds that they're using. Um, and then in addition to that national level HTA, we also, we also have state level HTA that make um, decisions on um, what should be funded within a hospital outside of that. Um, and they they obviously don't have an explicit threshold either, but again, they're using an implicit threshold. So I guess my answer would be that yes, it's possible, um, but how you'd go about estimating that, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know if, um, if any of the other speakers have any experience with that question, but I do think it's a really interesting one. Thanks, Laura. I think you also touched on um, something else about whether this has been taken up in policy. And we've had another question um, from Sadamini from HITAP who asks um, whether we would be able to share any barriers in the uptake or use of thresholds estimated for policy. For example, she asks uh, if it's considered too low and therefore difficult to get consensus on. Mm, yeah, I think um, I think the the value itself will have an impact on how it's perceived um, by policymakers for sure. Um, but I think if you do have um, their engagement at the very early stages of the project and their buy-in for the approaches that you're taking along the way then they can't really be all too surprised at the outcome and reject that um, at the very last stages. So I think building in that stakeholder engagement early on is really important. Um, and also um, thinking about who those relevant stakeholders are. So for example, in Australia, our national HTA body are able to make the decision to start using a threshold independent of any government legislation or anything. So, so they were definitely our stakeholders um, to be invited onto the advisory group. Um, but if in, in different healthcare systems, depending on who's making that decision as to who could use a threshold will, will depend on who your stakeholders are. Indeed. Um, Paul or Ajayoma, have, what was your experience in engaging stakeholders um, early on in the process? Okay, hi, mate. Thanks. Um, I wouldn't say there was much of an engagement uh, in the process, but I think it did help that there was a bit of backtracking um, on the use of the WHO one to three times GDP per capita. So, you know, that's what generally has been used for South Africa. And and with the, um, you know, recent, well, very not very recent, but, you know, the, the, uh, the paper that was put out by WHO to advise against its sole use may have, um, you know, been, you know, made it, the policymakers realized that perhaps, you know, they needed something more South African specific. So, I mean, like I said earlier, there isn't any, um, it's not been adopted officially, but just very recently last year, a HTA methods guide was published for use, um, guiding the, um, the use of HTA and HTA methods for resource allocation decisions in South Africa. And they did in that uh, policy document, I'm not sure it's called the policy document, but in the methods guide, um, they did uh, suggest the use of, of this threshold for 
um, uh, in cost utility analysis that you know are used for the Department of Health. It, it's interesting because the the National Depart Department of Health doesn't really have a, a huge sway on pro on province. Provinces have to make a decision on how what to spend the budget healthcare budget on. Uh, but they take guidance from the National Department of Health anyway. Uh, so things that are in the National Essential Medicine Police often get, um, you know, the provinces pick from, from that. And, and things that get into the National Essential Medicine List also go through the process of, um, uh, you know, looking at other considerations in addition to cost effectiveness analysis. And so for them to make that recommendation to use this threshold, um, is quite uh, a big a big deal, I think. Yeah. In our case, uh, a bit the the issue is that uh, the country has no mandatory HDA like uh, for most of technologies that enter into the country, so that makes it easy to produce the estimate and to socialize because it was not a requirement, so it was more like a reference at some point. But we expect it to be a little bit more intense uh, this year because it, it has taken time, but the, the new legislation that it has been entering through, through the last uh, years essentially is pushing HTA to be mandatory. And, uh, and now it's going to be part of the decision process for inclusion into the health benefits plan. The, a bit the difference here is that the, the plan essentially allows for any technology to be both unless it is explicitly banned and explicit bans are for experimental things in the US, something like this. But uh, essentially the like pharmaceutical companies can bring more or less whatever they want up to now. Now it's, this is going to change and that will make a very big uh, thing. So while we are comparing, following some some questions that is around uh, again, some other like the trace of some, some other country, I guess is what Yoma was saying and is that uh, most of the companies have on mind that the threshold is one to three GDP. So when we are using this as a comparison, we're making it explicit for these companies. Like, yeah, the, this is a, a bit too high for what the country needs are. And that's why we're doing this comparison. Thank you very much. I think, um, yeah, so the one to three times GDP being a bit too high kind of leads directly into another question that we've had um, from Astralakmal Shafi, who asks, uh, whether for a country that has both a supply and demand based threshold, how do we consolidate them or which to use? Um, and James has uh, sort of raised his hand um, to answer that question. So James, I'll hand that off to you. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, yes, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, as I mentioned in my short discussion, uh, these generally produce quite different estimates of what um, the cost per quality or Dali would be. Um, but I think also conceptually they're different also. Um, you know, one, the supply side is very much reflecting um, the supply side, how much health can be produced by healthcare funds. And the demand side is really about um, individual preferences for health and some sort of aggregation of those. And I think that because in all healthcare systems, um, healthcare is typically paid for through some sort of pooled um, resource, um, and there are constraints in doing that. Um, I think that we would expect that they're not necessarily going to be the same um, a priori, it, and that is confirmed by what we find with the estimates from the literature. Um, certainly, in the case of a tax finance system, it's well documented that there are costs associated with raising money through taxation. And so it might be the case that um, the estimate from the supply side uh, gives a lower cost per quality than those from the demand side. So I think that, as I said in my discussion, we need the supply side to work out the net health benefit. Um, that's kind of a first step as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. But then we might want to reflect um, that net health benefit in terms of its consumption value equivalent. And, and to do that, we could use some estimate of the consumption value of health. Um, so I think that that's how I would consider incorporating the two together. Um, I think there's also uh, just one more thing to say. Um, 
another use for comparing these estimates in this in the sense that we can say you know is it the case that we are um generating enough pooled resource for healthcare in our system if we find that the supply side estimate is far lower than the demand side estimate i think that in the context to bring it back to the uk context where a lot of my work is based we might think about whether you know the nhs is underfunded compared to what we think society's preferences are um and i think that it's plausible that that is the case you know it's a very complicated noisy process that determines how much money goes towards the nhs and i think it's somewhat implausible that it's always going to get it exactly right in terms of what economists think society values um but i think yeah there's lots of ways that these two sources of evidence can be combined but the supply side for me is really important because it helps us get those estimates of net health benefit. I don't know what others think, but that's my own view on it. Thank you, James. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I am going to um, pass uh, one more question that we've had actually asked twice um, on, which is uh, when we should use a quali or a dally for a threshold, or what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a quali or a dally? Um, we have had some other questions um, looking at uh, thresholds for rare diseases or high cost drugs. And that's something I think has been addressed on the Gear for Health website, um, which we'll post again um, the link to that in the chat. Yeah. And then there was uh, another question um, looking at why a threshold might be different across countries. So if we don't get time to answer that, which I don't think we will today, um, we will be able to answer that um, online later. And then before we leave, um, everyone could please stay to answer a poll to you, the audience members, um, which will help us determine what the topic of the next webinar will be. So uh, onto our last question, which is um, whether we should be using a quali or a dally for a threshold or what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Okay, in, in our case, it's more the, the standards available. We would prefer to have everything in terms of, of uh, quality at just like years, because there are technologies that are not essentially killing people, but they might improve the health of people. And that is reflected in some characteristics that the quality of just like years have that they are not entirely available on the DLA, on the disease adjusted. So the disease adjusted is more related to functioning of, of, of the body, if I can move and so on. The quality has things like uh, it's uh, more sensible to elements like uh, mental health. In our study at the end, it's more or less the same because what we are just doing is adjusting the values with the, the, with the quality because we don't have a perfect information about this. But uh, my feeling is that it's better to have qualities as the standard for doing this. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that one? I think it's it's a, a little bit of a difficult question to 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 ask. Um, I think it will it, the, the answering that would actually go back to trying to answer the 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 actual fundamental difference between a quali and a, and, and a dali and and what we are trying to capture with 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 the quali and the dali. I think that's where the the answer to that question actually lies beyond the the scope of this this particular webinar. But in South Africa, we did use cost per DALI, but, but there is a preference for the quality as well here. But I think it, we were limited by data availability. And, and you know, how do we make extrapolations on the qualities from other settings? And, you know, whether a quality not, a, a, you know, a utility estimate or quality from another setting represents the same quality for South Africa. So that that's, you know, there's been quite some, um, you know, evidence to show that um, those kinds of estimates are, are context context specific and, and maybe, and so that that was why um, we, we went down the DALI route, but there's definitely um, a preference for quality. And in fact, the um this this methods guide that I, I I I um highlighted earlier did make an assumption that a, a DALI was equivalent to a quali. 
and and so advice that they can be used interchangeably for studies are used and uh, quality qualities that as an outcome measure and also studies that use DALIs. so again like i said i think it goes back to the fundamental differences between DALIs and qualities and and whether one can use extrapolate qualities from other settings to uh, a certain a setting like south africa thank you Thank you, uh, Paul and Ajama, for those answers. Um, we are out of time now for the Q&A, so I want to extend our gratitude to the audience members um, for your attention, for joining us today, and for your great questions. And uh, a great thank you um, to our presenters, uh, Laura, Ajama, Paul, and James, um, for your really fantastic presentations. So I'm going to uh, close off today with a poll. So if we could please post the poll. And before you leave, please uh, cast your vote and let us know what we should have as our next uh, webinar topic. All right. Thank you to everyone and have a fantastic rest of your day or evening wherever you are.